guys, it's Kina, and today I will be checking out the World of Riot's MMO is already done by Necrit. Um, a lot of you have recommended me this. I don't know what this is about, but judging by the description of the video, it says, let's talk about Riot's upcoming MMO. So I'm guessing Riot's doing like a multiplayer game, uh, which is pretty sick. I only know about the arcade style game that they're putting out, which I will definitely probably be playing if that ever comes out. But that's the only thing I've heard about that game. So I know nothing about this, and I guess that's what this video is about. <laughs> So let's just go ahead and get right into it. If you do like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content from me. I upload these videos irregularly, so click on the notification bell to know when I upload and comment down below anything at all for my Twitch, my Instagram, and let's just jump right into the World of Riot's MMO is already done. All right, let's go. Uh, there's no, there is subtitles, but there's auto-generated ones. So I usually don't like to put on the auto-generated subtitles because they're sometimes inaccurate but some of you might want it so I'll just leave it on for now let me put it MMOs were regarded as the godfathers of games they were the peak of what developers could accomplish even though looking back that's a fairly subjective thing to say everyone knew MMOs had the power to create cult following but also everyone knew making MMOs was hard on average, an MMO has to spend at least six years in the baking before it can get anywhere near being good. But that didn't stop companies from jumping onto the bandwagon anyway. And soon we could see dozens of new MMOs, all releasing in 2008. All being called the WoW Killers. Spoiler alert, none of them did that. And unfortunately, we can feel the ripple effects even now. It got to a point where every time a new MMO is announced, we all think the same thing. That's true. Oh. Anyway. That's true. I think there's a Dune game coming out, which is an MMO. I think. I mean, it would work well as an MMO since, you know, the world is so huge. But I watched a gamer react to the announcement and a lot of people in the chat were like, not another MMO or something. When you're working on an MMO, you have to respect three pillars. Gameplay is king, social interactions matter, and the world setting is important. When Riot announced their MMO, it became clear that two of the pillars are being respected, and the third one is already done. When it comes to the gameplay, it is currently in the hands of Ghostcrawler, someone who's been working on WoW during its best times, and someone who got a reputation for hating boomkins and loving mages. When it comes to the social interactions, it is a dance between the developers and the players. A dev can guide players towards social interactions. Or they can annihilate them. And after that, the players usually find their own fun inside the MMO. From that point on, the devs should do everything in their power to support the players having fun in their own way. And finally, when it comes to the world of an MMO, in Riot's case, it's done, <laughs> and it's been finished for quite a few years now. In fact, the World of Riot's MMO is in such a good state, they already have the continents, the zones, the cultures, and the races. And to a lesser degree, every zone already has its own storyline. Now of course, unless you follow the lore of League of Legends, you wouldn't know about this. And that's why I decided to make this video. I want to show you all the zones we are going to see in the MMO and what sorts of quests we are going to do there. So, for the purpose of this video, I will assume you have no idea what League of Legends is about. You have no idea what the universe is about, but you like MMOs, your hairline is receding and you have a crippling fear of Nintendo 64 controllers. To which I might add, why do you think I'm wearing hats? But now, without further ado, let's have a look at all the zones in Riot's MMO. So obviously this isn't an official like video from League. I will just take it as it is. Is Rune Terra, the world of League of Legends. Right now, the world is separated into 10 main regions. But these 10 regions don't cover all the land on the map, so there are some mini zones in between them. And the lore already revealed that there is gonna be another continent further to the east. That definitely sounds like a future expansion to me. In fact, it would be foolish to release all of these regions at launch. You can easily turn half of these into separate expansions. And because a lot of people already know and love these regions, the hype behind these expansions would be big. With that said, I know a lot of you would like to play as Shremans or Ionians. 
and now you may be cursing me for suggesting that these would be expansions. But the lore can justify giving you these nations as playable races without having their regions. I'll show you how Riot can pull this off in a bit. First, let's talk about the regions Riot's MMO has to start with. Is Genshin Impact an MMO? Well, it doesn't really have a lobby. It doesn't have all those things, but you can join other people's worlds. There's also a lot of regions in Genshin, right? Um, that do get released patch by patch. Well, not not patch by patch, but some patches later. But <laughs> um, so there's that. So uh, the northern continent. This entire continent is called. So and and because like in Genshin, you can get characters. You know, obviously. Uh, Genshin is a gacha, actually. But you don't really have to do the gacha, you know? Old Valorant. I'm just like going off on Genshin, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me just go back a bit. Without having their regions. I'll show you how Riot can pull this off in a bit. First, let's talk about the regions Riot's MMO has to start with. The Northern Continent. This entire continent is called Valorant. Not Valorant. Valorant. And this is where the absolute core of this world is. The two main regions here are Demacia and Noxus. They are the two big rivals equivalent to the Horde and the Alliance. While I would like to say that Demacia is your classic normie human region, it's not really true. Runeterra doesn't really have a normal place. There is something cool happening in every region. And Demacia has racism. Okay, maybe not racism, because the Masia doesn't mind Yordles or Minotaurs, but they <laughs> really hate mages. That's because in the past, their rivals almost annihilated half of the world using magic. And so, the Masia was built inside a magic-absorbing forest. Therefore, the Masia is a really cool place where you can hide from magic. When it comes to the visuals of the zone, you can see a lot of lush fields, it is surrounded by mountains, but the iconic part of the Masia are the buildings. They are made of petricite, which is a combination of stone and the magic-absorbing wood. Because these ancient magic-absorbing trees were grey, all the buildings have a marble-like appearance. And yes, given what material they are using, all the buildings in the Masia also absorb magic. So should a mage visit this region, Let's just say it's gonna be a painful experience. On wow. top of this, let's not forget that Demacians can weaponize Petricite. They can turn it into Petricite Steel, which gives you your- Okay, I did read a bit on this yesterday. <laughs> I was actually looking through like the different regions of Runeterra, and that's pretty cool. Anti-magic weapons, and you can sculpt Petricite constructs which wake up after absorbing magic. Simply wow. said, these guys just really don't like magic. The irony is, they've been absorbing it for years now. And this is where the story would kick in. You see, the Masians are so afraid of magic, they founded the Mage Seeker Order. This is an order of people who hunt mages, they throw them in the prison, and they torture them until their body gives up on magic. So yes, being a mage is a crime in the Masia. The thing is, people still get naturally born with magical abilities. You can't stop it from happening. So not only are there mages hiding in the royal court, right now there is a mage civil war happening in the Masia, where mages and people who don't hate mages rise up to fight for moral rights. So should we do some quests in this zone, this is gonna be the core story. That's pretty cool. Mages trying to overthrow racist leadership following old laws. So the main enemy NPCs might be mages and witches. But I know what you're thinking now. And don't worry, there will be plenty of boars to kill here too. Or at least there are loads of wolves here, as well as stags. And we can't forget the iconic Demacian raptors. But further to the south, we might find some crag beasts, tiny woolly elephants, and yes, of course in the Argent Mountains there are also dragons. Loads and loads of dragons. But that's about it for Demacia. Fun fact, the capital city of Demacia is called the Great City of Demacia. <laughs> it sounds dumb, but Runeterra was not the first one to come up with this. But thankfully, the <laughs> other regions are a bit more creative with their names. So now, let's move away from the Normie region and let's have a look at the badass region. The Normie region. 
If you're planning on playing a warrior with oversized weapons and overcompensating lush hair, this is the region for you. This place actually has a long and badass history, but we really don't have the time to explain it now. So just know that originally it was built by the most badass warrior in the history of Runeterra. This motherfucker literally died on a mountain of corpses. And after he died, he was too angry to stay dead, so he just became the god of the underworld. When this guy lived, he built the Immortal Bastion, which is to this day the largest structure on the entirety of Runeterra. And currently he is banished underneath the Immortal Bastion, but only a few people know about it. So you know, that's a future raid boss. <laughs> anyway, the Immortal Bastion is the capital city of the Noxian Empire, with Noxus being one of the most brutal nations in Runeterra. It is brutal because the nation is surrounded by rocky earth. It is hard to grow plants here. So Noxians are forced into conquering surrounding land for resources to survive. That's why when you go to the map you can notice that the Noxian territory is all over the place. It's because these are all the places Noxus has already conquered. Although when I say it like that you may imagine Noxus brutally raiding everything. But that's not true. They like to absorb the surrounding nations into their empire. After all it's just more human resources. Most of the time they only remove the royalty and they let the leaderless people join their empire. And oh my god! Why does that remind me of Kuvira from Legend of Korra? <laughs> because Noxus values strength above all, and rulers tend to not be good fighters. This is what you can see in the after victory cinematic. They kill the king because he was weak and let everyone else join them. Fun fact, conquering nations is so iconic for Noxus they have their own saying. Kill them until they are family. So when it comes to the wow. quests in Noxus, it is most likely going to be helping the Empire expand its territory. Although this region has its own unique enemies too. Inside the Immortal Bastion there is a cult known as the Black Rose. This cult is connected to the darkest of magics. So be ready to fight Hemomancers, Witches, Demons and the Grey Legion. Which is an army of soldiers revived with blood magic to fight for the Empire again. And when it comes to collecting 10 bear asses, here we have the native Drakehounds and Basilisks. Now, while Noxus and Demacia are the main rivals here, both of them are also constantly repelling raids from the north. So now, let's have a look at the Freljord. Just Freljord, like pretty much any okay. region on Runeterra, Freljord has a long history. But for the purpose of this video, just know that the maddening old gods known as the Watchers of the Void, who want to devour the entire reality only because it keeps waking them up, once tried to breach into reality here. They almost succeeded because they tricked the Ice Witch Lysandra into helping them. Fortunately she realized how wrong she was and she managed to freeze half of the kingdom with the Watchers still beneath them. So these days the Ice Witch is the only person holding back the end of reality by keeping the Watchers frozen. So at some point in the future, you bet one of these woken up frozen watchers is gonna be a raid boss. <laughs> now, when it comes to the NPCs, this is where things get diverse. First of all, remember that the Freljord is brutally cruel. Everything is frozen and survival is everything. So the first enemy here would be the wildlife. From Rhymefangs to Yetis to Druvasks to Elnux to Mammoths to the worst of them all, Poros. Next we are going to fight the Freljordians <laughs> themselves. There are three main tribes here. The Avarosans who are quite peaceful, the Wintersclaw who are quite brutal and the Frostguard, wow. Lysandra's followers who hold back the Watchers. And let me tell you- They have such guys, a cool design, sorry. Ooh, 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 I love concepts like these. Lysandra's followers who hold back the Watchers. And let me tell you, these guys have some badass armor. Among the notable tribes there are also the Ursine, which are shamans who worship the Volibear, the primal god of the wild who slowly turns his worshippers into twisted animalistic monstrosities. Speaking of which, yes, there are also the primal gods of Freljord. And finally, we need to talk about the Iceborn. When the Watchers tried to arrive here, they tainted the ice around them. This special ice is called the True Ice. 
and it is so dangerous you literally die if you touch it. However, the Watchers also tainted some people, giving them the ability to touch the ice. It is still extremely painful for them to hold a true ice weapon, but at least they can survive it. These people are known as the Iceborn. But people were not the only things that were tainted. There are also Ice Trolls, some of whom are also Iceborn. To be honest, these guys were made to have their own dungeon. But there are also some animals that were twisted by the Watchers. And Lysandra is even twisting some beings herself to make them serve her. So overall, Freljord is gonna have a lot of cool warriors, shamans and horrors. So these would be the three <laughs> regions on the main continent. Those are really cute though! Horrors. <laughs> They're so cute! Hold on, let me- I need to go back to it. I need to go back! Please. Look at them! <laughs> They're so cute. Oh my god. There's a tiny one here. Oh, look at this one looking. This one is sleeping. Oh my god, they're cute. <laughs> so these would be the three regions on the main continent. But this place is actually so big it can easily make the base world of the game. Especially since there yeah, are a bunch of true. smaller regions in between them. There is Nokmerch full of witches, Argent Mountains with their dragons, Tokugol with void monsters, Dalamor Plains with him, and so much more. But from here you can cleverly set up the expansions because of how well everything is interconnected. So now let's have a look at the continent to the east called Ionia. Ionia has a very close connection to Noxus. You can only guess why. It's because Noxians once tried to conquer it all during an event simply called the Invasion of Ionia. This was a horrible war full of using children as soldiers because Noxians thought Ionians wouldn't fight back against children. And chemical weapons. Lots and lots of chemical weapons. Speaking of which, remember Singed from Arcane? He's the guy who chemically devastated Ionia. Eventually Noxus failed, but they kept their small controlled territories. So the first quest here could be simply boarding a ship, sailing over, and exploring the place for the Noxian Empire. Now, when it comes to Ionia itself, the place gets mystical. Everything here is alive and connected to the spirit of nature. And I mean everything, from the animals to the people to the buildings. I kind of got that from the Tales of Runeterra videos, right? I think they did show it a bit. I forgot what the video was called, but it was about Ionia. <laughs> Everything is alive. So if you anger Mother Nature, your house can twist and strangle you in your sleep. So you can only imagine how Mother Nature fought against Noxians. Usually a river came alive to drown them. That's why all the buildings here look like they were woven from wood. It's because they were. With nature magic, people let nature build their houses. It also means that sometimes your house can just walk away. <laughs> when it comes to the NPCs here, obviously there is gonna be a lot of nature spirits. And a lot more of simply mystical animals. From giant flying tigers to the never-ending story. But be ready to also face local Ionians, blade masters, shadow cultists, murderers and ninjas. <laughs> Both good, bad and the in-between. But finally, there is also one more enemy that we could face. The furries. That's <laughs> right, this race is known as the Vastaya. They are Staya. half humans and half magical animals. And yes, canonically, the species was born in exactly the way you are thinking. But to be fair, the Vastaya are quite cool and they are definitely gonna be a playable race. Just like Yordles, who also like Ionia so a lot. Cute. Lastly, <laughs> after Noxians ravaged Mother Nature, demons started occupying all the places. Wait, what is what is set what is set half of? Sorry, I'm just gonna go back. Ari is obviously a fox. The furry. What is he ha half of? Is it a wolf? A dog? And they are definitely gonna be a playable race. Just like Yordles, who also like Ionia a lot. Lastly, after Noxians ravaged Mother Nature, demons started occupying all the places filled with misery and doubt. So that's gonna be a nice bonus enemy. 
So yes, the exploration of Ionia and the raid on the Shadow Order could be a really cool first expansion. But it's definitely not Riot's only option, because we can also go south to Piltover and Zone. These are the ones people will know about, simply because this is where Arcane took place. Piltover and Zone are two massive cities located one above the other. And they are so massive they could easily be turned into their own playable zones. They are both focusing on futuristic technology powered up by magic of the Hextech gemstones. Using this magic they can power up anything from guns to augmented limbs to vehicles. Visually it is simply futuristic Victorian era. And unfortunately there wouldn't be much of enemy variety. We would likely fight the rich houses of Piltover and their deadly assassins with the occasional thief on the streets, corrupt wardens and the occasional rogue steam golem. But things get a bit more interesting in the undercity known as Zone. Zone is the dirty underbelly covered in thick toxic smoke. Because the majority of people are poor here, they developed a cheaper alternative to Hextech called Chemtech. This artificial green stuff can power up cheaper limb replacements, as well as highly unstable weaponry. Zon is also controlled by the Cam Barons, which are obviously gonna be the main enemy here. But on the side, we may also meet some chemical mutants, unstable constructs, as well as some mass murderers and people who hunt down mass murderers. And funnily enough, at the very very bottom of Zon itself, there are the hidden ruins of an ancient city full of traps. That is obviously gonna be a cool dungeon. So yes, there is not much more that I can add here, Piltover and Zon were simply explored in Arcane. So if you like the series, you are gonna like this place. From here, we For can sure. travel further south to Shurima. Because like, Shurima, being able to like, I think I mentioned in my last video, but I was like, imagine living in a world like League, and this is basically it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool because, you know, I like to play games like FF7, DMC, Cyberpunk. But especially Cyberpunk because I really like to imagine just being in such a futuristic world like that. So yeah, it would be really interesting, you know, to see this and to be able to actually be in the universe itself, you know, because like Arcane, you watch, you're you're looking at Piltover, you're looking at Zon, and it's like, wow, you know, this place, you know, it exists there. But then if, if this game comes out, you get to be in there. And that's pretty cool. It used to be a massive empire that ruled the world. But after the emperor got betrayed by his best friend... Hold on. Okay. Further south to Shurima. Shurima. Shurima used to be a massive empire that ruled the world. But after the emperor got betrayed by his best friend, the entire empire collapsed. This region is a massive desert with the occasional city near a river. In the center of the region there is the sun disk, a colossal piece of star metal that has the power to reflect celestial magic. The Shurimans use this celestial magic to turn their best soldiers into the Ascended, also known as the Golden God Warriors. However, these God Warriors wouldn't make a great enemy here. That's because after the Emperor had died, the Ascended started fighting for leadership. And slowly, after learning how to use blood magic to gain the edge, they morphed their own bodies and became the Darkin. Twisted, blood frenzied monsters that would certainly make really cool raid bosses. Besides this ancient evil, Shurima is also full of its own animals, raiders, dune scavengers, and on top of all of that, cool. void creatures. That's because to the south, there used to be a kingdom known as Ikathia that wanted to destroy the Shuriman Empire. So, they asked the Watchers for help. You can imagine how that went. The Watchers sent through some Void Beasts that consumed wow. Ikathia and polluted Shurima to this day. To fight back the Void, Shurima does have a lot of hidden tombs around with hidden God Warrior weapons. Not to mention that Shurima also has a circle of Time Mages who are trying to freeze the Void in time. Now, as I mentioned near the beginning of the video, even if Shurima becomes an expansion, they can still easily make Shurimans a playable race because they are already connected to Noxus. As you can see, of course, Noxians already conquered part of Shurima. So some Shurimans are fighting for Noxus. 
Also, as a cool fact for those of you who liked Arcane, Hex Crystals are harvested in Shurima. That's why a Shuriman expansion would be a great follow-up to Piltover and Zone. And again, that's why Riot can easily turn only the northern continent into the base world. Anyway, going west from Shurima, we arrive at Mount Targon. This place is incredibly unique. First of all, this mountain is not natural. It was literally pulled up from the ground by celestial gods. And that's because this place serves as a portal to the celestial realm, also known as Targon Prime. Now, because this mountain was pulled up, it also has some unique features. For example, you may find frozen lakes frozen horizontally on the mountain. And the very peak of the mountain is special too. Should a mortal reach the peak despite the brutal climate and the deadly wildlife, either they die from exhaustion, or the celestial gods deem them worthy and they become an ascended aspect. There is aspect of war, aspect of the sun, aspect of the moon, aspect of the twilight, aspect of the guardian, and so on. Simply said, after people reach the peak, they become some of the strongest beings on the entire planet. So of course, the mountain is full of people who worship the celestial demigods. And I speculate this is where we could get a lot of cool armor sets. There are the Solari, who are devoted to the aspect of the sun. Then there are the rivals, the Lunari, who are devoted to the aspect of the moon. But also the tribe I assume will become a playable class, the Warriors of Rakor. Of course, besides just humans, Targon also has all sorts of furry Vastaya. Near the bottom of the mountain you may notice that the mountain is alive. But also there are Stellar Corns, a variety of mind-bending creatures and loads and loads of dragons. Speaking of which, remember that this place is linked to the Celestial Realm. So this is where we may also meet the star-forging Celestial Dragon Aurelian Soul, as well as all sorts of other Celestial beings. A lot of these would make for interesting bosses. In fact, the ascension of Mount Targon would be a really cool raid. Next, on the other side of Shurima, there is Ishtal. This is a special place where people are mastering the elemental magic. They are using it for everything. Fishing, smithing, walking. And this place is definitely gonna be saved for an expansion. Basically, remember when Ikathian asked the Watchers for help? And then that happened? Ishtal was their neighbor and after they saw the Void devour an entire kingdom, they believed the Void would soon devour the entire world. So, using their elemental magic, Ishtal built massive walls of plants around their entire region, isolating themselves from the rest of the world. For three and a half thousand years, Ishtal stayed isolated, believing that the world outside of their walls was devoured by the void. But now, very recently, some mages found out that the world outside is completely fine. <laughs> so now the Ishtali mages are slowly revealing themselves. To be honest, Ishtal is the most underdeveloped region in Runeterra. We know the region has a lot of hunting Vastaya, deadly it's plants, like and Island. some elemental dragons, but most of the region is still a mystery to us. So at least here, Riot will have the freedom to try something new. But now, we leave the main continent to visit the last two regions. First of all, there is Bilgewater. Bilgewater. If you like pirate adventures, this is gonna be your place. This is where we are going to explore inns and gambling dens, even some local temples worshipping the god of motion, Nagake Boros. Here we are going to fight pirates and sea monsters, sea witches, sea vastaya, maybe some demons. And possibly we'll side with Sarah Fortune to fight the king of the pirates, Gangplank. But there's a lot more here. Last year Riot released their RPG which was set in Bilgewater. So not only can we already explore this place in detail, but it even has a monster journal. And at a quick glance you can already see some really cool bosses too. However, this place is also linked to the last place I want to show you today the Shadow Isles. See, every year the horrors of the Shadow Isles lurk out, and Bilgewater just happens to be the closest place. So every year Bilgewater is fighting the undead. Once upon a time the Shadow Isles used to be the Blessed Isles, a rich place full of advanced magic. 
Long story short, there was a young asshole king who wanted to revive his dead queen. And in the process, he accidentally released dark necromantic magic. This magic destroyed the island and made it home for undeath. In the lore, this event is called the Ruination. And because the RPG is called the Ruined King, it may not be a surprise to you that you also get to explore the Shadow Isles there. And there they have anything you can imagine. Undead horrors creeping everywhere. And should we ever venture into these islands? I have no idea whom we're going to fight. <laughs> the Ruined King who caused all of this is banished elsewhere. Thresh, who siphoned his magic after he was banished, also left the Isles. And even Hecarim, the most <laughs> brutal soldier of them all, is currently around Demacia. So the Shadow Isles don't currently have a main baddie. So this is where Riot could push forward some of the side characters. Now, even though these have all been the regions that are currently set up on Runeterra, Riot has already confirmed that there is a new continent further to the east. Ooh. Currently, it is planned to be revealed in the upcoming Ruination novel. And so far, we know that this new continent is where the ruined King Viego is from. And this is also where he was banished at the end of his story. All we know about that place is that it is quite mystical. There are yet more dragons here. And in fact, Kamavor, which is the ruined King's nation, has a lot of draconic armor. So should Riot run out of places to explore, don't worry, they can always make up more. But that's, <laughs> that's true. all I wanted to show you today. As someone who's been following the lore of League of Legends from the very beginning, I can tell you, I'm very confident the setting of Riot's MMO is gonna be great. Their incredible writers have been preparing the world for years now. And now, it's time to harvest the fruit. If you like this video, let me know in the comments below. That was great. Um, I kind of stopped talking a bit there because I was just super invested <laughs> in the story. First things first, I just wanted to say that it's, you know, watching this and getting more about the, not getting the lore to the full extent, but getting at least some idea of, you know, how, the places, the regions and stuff. Um, it's really putting a different perspective on, you know, the cinematics that I, ha that I have watched. It, it puts a bit more like backstory to each cin cinematic, but... Uh, this is definitely really interesting. I mean, League of Legends already has a big world, as we just saw. It's they can do anything, to be honest. Um, but but what Neckert said about making for Freljord, Freljord, Demacia, and Noxus as the like the base game, it it would be a pretty smart move. I mean, they, and then they can branch out to other places, which is which is really reminding me of Genshin Impact. <laughs> I will definitely play this. I mean, if it comes out, I will definitely play it. I also wanted to mention that I actually do play um, the card game, Tales of Runeterra. <laughs> so I know like a bit of... Well, I'm still like really at the beginning. So, uh, so I do kind of get some information from there as well. It's pretty cool. The world building in this is amazing. You know, you have the world building, you have the lore, you have the novels, you have the art you have you just have everything it's it's such a great world to be in you know especially as someone who really likes fantasy and stuff like this it's it's really interesting i feel like out of all the places really i feel i would want to see demacia a lot because i don't know just the thought that they hate magic so much but all their weaponry and everything it's just it absorbs magic and stuff i mean hey anti-weapons you know that's that's pretty sick um it's pretty cool the noxus part kind of <laughs> kind of reminded me of um kuvira from uh Korra, where you know how she was like gathering all you know the poor people and everything and basically essentially just blackmailing them into joining her the empire <laughs> Uh, it just reminded me of that. Yeah, this is really fun. I really enjoyed it. I really, I got really immersed into the to the whole learning everything about it. I think Nicker does a really. I mean, he said it himself. He's been following this since forever. Do let me know if there are any other videos, you know, lore related videos of League of Legends that you would want me to check out um, because I would be pretty interested in that. Uh, I might not do reactions to them. I might just watch them in my own time since it is just technically just taking in information so I, I don't know if that will be interesting but 
uh, yeah, do let me know. And I guess if you did like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content from me. I upload these videos irregularly, so click on the notification bell to know when I upload and comment down below anything at all. Follow my Twitch, my Instagram, and I will see you guys in the next League of Legends video.